Thank you, Lama. Dear esteemed guests, President Fadlu Khouri, Provost Zahar Dawi, Dr. Firas Abiyad, Dr. Lama Musawi, colleagues, students, and friends at the Suleiman Ulayan School of Business at the American University of Beirut. Let me start with uh, going back, being a university professor teaching leadership and ethics at the school, let me take you back to one classic case of a business failure. This case is full of controversy with opposing viewpoints. In 2014, Toys R Us, the giant toy retailer, was forced to remove from its shelves four collectible dolls based on characters from the AMC hit show Breaking Bad, which revolves around Walter White, a high school chemistry teacher, turned crystal meth dealer, drug dealer. Each doll came with a detachable sack of cash and a bag of meth. A stunned Florida mother began a petition against Toys R Us on change.org. The petition garnered 9,000 signatures in favor of her claim that a show celebrating the drug trade is unsuitable for sale outside Barbie dolls and Disney characters. I don't know the dynamics of the decision-making process or who made the decision at the company at that time. But many would assert that this was a classic case of groupthink related to lack of diversity of the team behind the failing product. Who collected the market data? Who analyzed it? Who thought that having a doll with a bag of meth presented a good business idea? Was it a group of single-minded individuals lacking diversity and creativity that led to this business blunder? And perhaps relevant to our conference today, how many women were on the team? Under the title, Data is Everything, the Importance of Closing the Gender Data Gap, a 2022 Rush report explained the gender data gap, noting that, quote, data is essential to the modern world. It drives everything from innovation and research to business decisions. For too long, women have been systematically overlooked and underrepresented in healthcare, causing a gender data gap that has led to a lack of knowledge about conditions that primarily or predominantly affect women or affect women differently. I would argue that what applies in this quotation to healthcare also applies to business systems and organizational processes. When men comprise a majority of analysts and managers, when men are overly represented even more at the upper level of the organization, and this applies to a wide variety of domains in consulting, construction, automotive industry, and many other businesses. What does this mean for our design of marketing campaigns, for example? What does it mean when we attempt to understand consumer behavior? What does it mean when we try to develop advanced human uh, resource systems? What does it mean when we try to explore various ways to motivate our workforce? Ignoring women and underrepresenting them will, in, will eventually lead to faulty decisions and business failures. Imagine a world where data is collected overwhelmingly by men handled by men, processed by men, and seen only from the perspectives of men. Decisions would then be made by men based on such data processes that have gone through the male filter. What a loss. This would be no lesser a loss than having a world where data is only handled by women. Some might argue otherwise though. In the business world, this would mean a significant lack of opportunity of innovation and of economic and social capital. Let's reflect upon what decision-making in times of crisis entail, which is the theme of this conference. What would women be able to contribute to decision-making in times of crisis? What would women be able to contribute that men cannot contribute? There is some research that tackles this very point. The research suggests that there are differences between the configuration of women's brains and men's brains. I recognize this and there are in the audience, many individuals who are more experienced and more knowledgeable than I am. But I know that the implications thereof are contested and we might not agree on everything pertaining to that. Nevertheless, some would assert here, I'm quoting again, that women's brains are tightly packed with connections. This allows them to perform better at tasks involving the bigger picture and situational thinking. A man's brain tends to perform better at spatial thinking involving recognizing patterns and problem solving with objects in a spatial environment." End quote. If we accept this claim at face value, what would women be able to add to decision-making in times of crisis? How would women approach data? 
How would they handle data? How would they understand data? And what do they have to offer that men would not be able to offer? Wouldn't crisis situations necessitate that decision makers look at the big picture, look at situational thinking or involve situational thinking, things that women are argued to excel at? Some contend that such different wirings in the brains lead to men and women leveraging different strengths. These varying qualities put together would be critical in reaching thorough conclusions and decisions, especially in the world of business, that take numerous variables into account. Now, beyond the instrumental role of empowering women in data science, there is obviously an ethical argument for such empowerment. It is a societal obligation to provide women very much like men with every opportunity to go into this domain and not categorize this as an intrusion into an area that primarily belongs to their male counterparts. Some research led by Anita Williams Woolley at Carnegie Mellon University addressed what is called the collective intelligence of a group. Woolley and her colleagues asserted that social sensitivity was the single most significant predictor of a group's collective intelligence. Women, the research team asserts, are more sensitive to social situations compared to males. The research team concluded that if you want to make a team smarter, women need to be an integral part of that team and their ideas need to be listened to. We at the Hawaiian School of Business, we at the American University of Beirut, we hope that we are able to adopt this perspective. We sternly believe that our collective intelligence as a team is not amplified by having one or two very high IQ individuals among us, although that helps. It is by leveraging the presence of a diverse team of colleagues, men and women, who work together to make this institution the great institution that it is. So I invite you on this occasion of this conference to raise our collective intelligence, and I count on that. Thank you to the conference's organization, organi organizing committee, the large number of persons and volunteers who helped make it possible, and to the AUB that helped make it happen. Thank you very much. <laughs>